Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Language Properties of Phone Scammers in South Seas CDF with Dr. Judith Tabron. Before we begin, I have a few brief notes. Uh, we encourage you to stop by the business hall located downstairs in Bayside AB. Uh, the Black Hat Arsenal is on this floor in the Palm Foyer on level three, this, this level. And of course, the Arsenal reception is today at five o'clock. If you have not picked up your merchandise, today is the last chance because the Black Hat Schwag and the Black Hat Bookstore are closing today. Also, we encourage you to visit the Cali Linux uh, lab in Mandalay Bay A. They're doing very interesting stuff down there with the new Cali release. Now is also a good time to put your phone on vibrate. It makes it easier for the rest of us to ignore your phone as you're waiting for it to ring through to voicemail. It also is just, it's just common courtesy, you know? It's, it's a nice thing. Uh, so we're going to begin, Dr. Judith Tabern. Thanks, folks. Um, I am an old college professor, so I'm not going to make everybody move up to the front because I'm familiar with the phenomenon of teacher cooties, but if you do want to move up to the front, don't worry about disturbing me. Just come on up. I promise not to talk to you, and there is no grading. Um, so this is language properties of phone scammers, cyber defense at the level of the human. And just to give you a little overview of what I'm going to chat about, um, Obviously, you're all here because you know that we need to secure the human. The human is usually the weakest link in uh, our cyber defense, and what can we do to actually secure that link? I want to talk a little bit about the technology tools that exist out there, but I don't have any technology tool to offer you. So if you're upset, if you don't have anything uh, to develop for, you can uh, check out now. But it's, it's cool. I want to show you sort of what's out there, and then we'll talk about what other kinds of things we can do with actual people. What forensic linguistics can do, because I know it's an area that's probably new to most or all of you, um, and then we're going to talk about applying forensic linguistics to phone scam data that I have, just a limited set, and then deriving a useful test to detect some phone scams. Because I feel like if I don't give you a practical takeaway, it's not really uh, worthy of black hat. Um, and I want it to be worthy of black hat. So we're going to get there. Stay with me. Just to get the introductions out of the way, because people often start out by saying, Judith Tabern, don't you have like a PhD in literature? Didn't you write a paper on Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Yes, that is me. Um, I do have a, P a PhD in global literature, and I have been doing a lot of research on popular culture. I took a slight uh, foray to screenwriting and fiction writing, um, and now I'm going to be teaching forensic linguistics this fall. But through all of that, I have always had an IT career. I'm an old uh, sysadmin. If you didn't go to the AD talk yesterday morning, you missed out. That was good stuff. Um, and that's why. I'm always interested in IT because I have an IT hat. I have an IT career. And if uh, that's too much, too long, didn't read version, uh, my mother was a sysadmin for DARPA. So that's why I have an IT career and a PhD in literature. So let's take a look at what's out there for securing the human. You probably know in this group that every major data breach you've read about in the papers, people have credentials. A lot of times that's through phishing. Sometimes it's not. And so... What do we do to secure people right now? Just to give you a quick overview of some of the tools that are out there, and I have nothing good or bad to say about any of these companies. I have no affiliation with them or any inside knowledge. This is just publicly available information that I'm giving you that you may or may not already have. Um, one of the major tools that's out there is about phone printing. This is Pindrop. Um, they have a patent and uh, a lot of venture capital funding. Uh, already used it, two of the four biggest banks. And Pindrop will build a phone print, that is to say, a biometric signature of both your voice and the phone that you are calling on. Uh, so it is a biometric signature, and in this group I don't think I have to rehearse too much about what are the shortcomings of biometric signatures. Of course, like all biometric signatures, it's not storing all of the data available, it's storing a digest, and then the question becomes, you know, how often is it an accurate match for the data that it's getting with whatever authentication process you're using. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit. But in this case, I just want to point out that what Pindrop does is it identifies the caller and the caller's location. That's what the product is for. Another product that's out there in the world right now is Uptivity, which does stress detection. Um, and Uptivity was originally called Call Copy, and it was actually designed so that you could run it on your call center. Uh, you have to record every call as it's coming and going, 
And originally it was designed so that you could identify the call center agents that were not good and decide who you should be getting rid of. Um, so it is sound based, it's phonology uh, anal and analysis. It can do keyword spotting, so for instance if somebody on the phone mentions a competitor of yours, uh, this would tell you and, and it, they do say that it happens in real time. They report an accuracy greater than 80 to 90 percent and if you are the kind of IT person I am, you already do the math and you're like that means a fail rate of 10 to 20 percent, but I get it. Um, and it does work in real time. So in this case, this is just a brief uh, quote from an article that's already out there. This is doing talk analysis that can identify patterns within calls such as long hold times. Well, you can identify that now, right, with an ACDQ analysis. Periods of silence as well as the frequency of an agent cutting off a caller. So this is more interesting to me because the data that I'm going to show you today shows evidence of both of those instances, but both of them in the same interaction. So then my question becomes how easily would this work for me uh, in one phone call and also is it available for home use? I have a challenge with spreading this technology out really widely because there's some privacy issues, right? We're talking about basically recording every call going in and out. But if your company needs that. This one is identifying keywords and emotion and I have to put emotion in quotes because I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact that um, emotion may or may not be genuine and it may or may not be phonologically indicated. So here's the waveform of one of the IRS phone calls that I'm going to talk to you about a little bit later. But I just want you to realize that there's two scammers on the phone call. There's clearly two phone lines and the audio uh, sort of picture of the first phone, phone caller doesn't look anything like the audio picture of the second phone caller. Um, in this case, there's scammer A who is the original phone caller, scammer B is the target, or speaker B is the target, and scammer C is the uh, second phone caller. And you can see that they're in totally different phone lines, totally different connections. And they do use silences and interruptions in different ways. So just to say again, I'm going to talk to you more about this data, but this is just on one phone call. This includes both non-standard pauses and gaps and interruptions in the same phone call. So I don't think this is going to survive our messing with the sound. So briefly, this is the, this is the first part of the phone call and I just want to play it for you that you can hear the pauses. That's the reason you have miscalculated your tax. Oh my God, how much? The amount which is outstanding on your name is $4,550.95. Oh my God, what do I do? Ma'am, at this time you cannot do anything on this. Okay, so the main source of this call was to inform you that the arrest warrant which have been issued on your name is for the charges of tax evasion. So if you hear those pauses, those are not the types of pauses people tend to have in a conversation. And when I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about what forensic linguistics can do, it's just about what's standard versus what's non-standard. And those pauses are non-standard. You hear it. There's nothing you can do about this. It's uncomfortable if I just wait that long. Well, you guys are sitting here waiting for me to talk, right? There, the scammer is actually waiting for the target to fill that silence. And the question is, what do I do? How can I solve this? pulling them into the situation, that's the, what that piece of the call is for. But there are other pieces of the call. So here's a sound from a different, the, the second caller. I can go to send an email to the detective to go to put a hold on the warrant so that you don't get arrested while resolving the situation. Oh, All thank, right? uh, thank you so much. And now, if once I go to the Wind Dixie, why don't you just give me um, your address so I can send the tax voucher to because... I'll um, let you know that, ma'am. I'll, I'll give you that information step by step. But I'm not going to be at my phone when I, I'm at Wind Dixie. I'm going to be out in my car. So can you... You can provide me a cell phone, ma'am. You can provide me a cell phone because we have to stay online with you while doing this okay. procedure because I don't want you to do any mistake and while it's any law so that you put yourself into a big... I don't, I don't have Sorry a cell, now. I don't have a cell phone. Can you just call, can you let me know? Right, so she's irritated now, right? And you can hear they're talking over each other, they're interrupting. That can actually happen in friend conversations. You probably interrupt your friends all the time. It's called latching. This is not latching. They're not finishing each other's sentences or thoughts. They're interrupting each other. And she does get irritated if you can hear at one point she even goes, ah. 
uh, which is sort of occurring in the call. So can Optivity detect that? That would be really interesting to find out. If anybody is in the room who works for them, I really want to chat with you. Some of the other competitors that are in this space really briefly, there's not a ton. Um, Variant, which uh, acquired Victrio, creates a voice print. So not a phone print, but a voice print of a person's voice, as you could imagine, just uh, identifying that person. And it will identify known phone scammers. And of course, all you need to defeat that is a non-known phone scammer. Um, so this is a blacklisting technology. Uh, trusted verifies A&I before the phone call even starts. And if you, in this crowd, I assume a lot of people do know what A&I is, but just in case you came to learn, um, A&I is that phone company switch data that actually knows where a call is coming from. And trusted is going to identify that the phone call is coming from where it says that it's coming from, or more importantly, that you expect it to be coming from in order to verify a transaction. That uh, is a different technology altogether. And then, you know, people will list autonomy, which was required by HP as another competitor in this space, but really all that does is capture unstructured, unstructured data to add it to your CRM. So these are the sort of tools that are out there currently. Um, they may or may not solve the problem. So I, wearing my IT hat, look at this and I say, you know, I want something cheaper because everyone thinks universities have tons of money, but we don't. I want something with fewer privacy issues. I actually used to run three call centers um, in my position uh, in IT. And I want to focus on a different goal. I don't want to identify a particular caller and I don't want to introduce a new biometric signature. I would like to just identify when there is a crime occurring, if that's possible. Um, and that was what got me interested. And I want it to fail closed. So again, in this group, I don't expect people to be surprised by this, but you know, biometric signatures do have challenges where you know, the standard ones that are out there for co co commodity use, like your phone print reader on your iPhone, they do fail at a reasonably you know, predictable rate. And because they don't want to lock you out of your iPhone, they're going to fail open. Uh, and that's not good enough for my transactions. Um, so I would like it ideally to fail closed. So, also I am a teacher and I, I do believe in uh, humanism and I don't want to give up on the human. It's the humans that need help, although this conference is full of people who will help you with the IT stuff as well. So then I became aware of forensic linguistics and I just want to briefly talk a little bit about what forensic linguistics is and what it can do. Don't worry, I'm not going to spend the whole rest of the time talking about this, but just to give you an intro. Okay, forensic linguistics is forensic. So it is studying language evidence uh, Theoretically with the theory that it's going to be introduced in a court case and it has to adhere to ro rules of evidence submission, um, whether it's Daubert or Fry or whatever pertains in your state. So there are certain types of things that have already been done with forensic linguistics. Um, threat analysis is a very common one, author attribution, legal language disputes, trademark, contract disputes. What does this actually say? You can actually have people sit in a room all day and argue about what this means, but you could also just call a forensic linguist and sort that out. Um, and then, of course, conviction exoneration, which is another type of author attribution. But just to give you some pointers to other um, talks, if you want to take a look at them, oh, I'm going to show you this first. How does linguistics actually work? It is linguistics. It's not just forensic, it's linguistics. What does linguistics do? Linguistics is the study of the system of language. Language is actually really systematic. Now, you know it's also really productive. If you Google search a sentence that is in my book and you find, you're probably going to find my book, right? Because language sentences do tend to be f frequently very unique. On the other hand, it's incredibly predictable. If I say something to you, you heard me, you understood it, you say something back. That's magical. How does that system work? All languages have systems. Well, they work on different levels. And so linguistics works on a multiple level analysis from phonological analysis right down at the bottom. This is how I say eight. If you're from Philadelphia or Brooklyn, you might say eight differently. Um, morphological, how does the word change in a sentence? Sentence level analysis, which includes both semantics and pragmatics. So semantics is what is the proposition being made? It can be really simple, like the dog ate my dessert. It can be really complex. Um, my favorite example is how you know if you hear the sentence, I might only have one match, but I can make an explosion, you heard a threat, but not a confession, right? There's all kinds of complex interaction there. Nobody else listens to bad pop music. Is that just me? You know that song, I only have one match, but I can make an explosion? When a cute little girl singer sings it, it's not frightening. I love that sentence. Um, 
Then there's also pragmatics, which is how does this actually work in everyday life? If I say to you, the dog ate my dessert, there has to be a dog that's known to both of us. Okay, otherwise I don't say the dog ate my dessert. I say a dog ate my dessert. All right, so semantics and pragmatics are working together on that level. And then at the very top level, there's how people interact. And that's what I want to draw our attention to more today, which is, you know, sociolinguistics, but also discourse analysis. If I say, I'm sorry, you say, what do you say? I'm sorry. He sat, he sat in the front now. See, this is what the problem is with sitting in the front. I say, I'm sorry, and you say, it's okay, right? He doesn't have to say that. There's all kinds of things he could say. But if I say, I'm sorry, and you say, pass the bread, are we having a fight? Like, did we just break up? What happened? Like, it's not something non-standard happened, right? You do know what the pieces are of a conversation. Fluent speakers will do that appropriately. Native speakers will do it appropriately. Language learners won't. But in general, if you speak the language, you do know how to have a discourse. So that's part of what I'm going to be looking at today. Just shooting really briefly past the stars of forensic linguistics so that you can go home and look them up because I'm a college professor and I want you to, even though I know you won't. Um, Roger Shy and the Devil Strip case is probably the most famous example of forensic linguistics um, sort of for fun that I can introduce you to today. So let's take a look at this one. Here's an actual ransom note. Can everybody read it? Can some of you read it? Can anybody read it? We can read, right? Okay, good. Take a look. So what do you notice about this ransom note? I'm not going to pick on you anymore. You're all right. What's misspelled? Cops. Yep, what else? There are exclamation points, and I'm going to talk more about those exclamation points. You get a gold star. Does anybody notice the dropped words at the bottom? Anyone with you, the deal is off, right? So there's a couple of dropped words, right? Okay. Here's the thing about language. This person is trying to convince you that they're stupider than they are. That's hard. Um, and I threw orthography up on, this, on the slide previously, and I didn't mention it, and I should have. It was to set up for this. Because um, linguists will go, oh, that's orthographic, I don't care about that. But actually how we write language is also very uh, predictable and difficult to disguise. So here's what most people notice about these, uh, this note. You guys all got it. The can, the cops, drop daughter, and mis dropping, misspelling daughter, right? Makes sense. However, nobody misspells daughter and correctly spells precious. Precious is a hard word. All right. Also, every single sentence is correctly capitalized and punctuated, including those exclamation points, which escalate in excitement. One, two, three. I love the exclamation points. Uh, and there is a regionalism here that you guys sort of skied past because you either got it or you didn't. And what is, does any, is there anybody who knows what Devil Strip is? Because then I'll know where you're from, right? Uh, devil strip is a word for between the curb and the sidewalk, the grass. It's only used in one place. Now, when Rob Leonard gives this talk, he likes to make the joke that to understand that, you just have to be Roger Shy. You don't have to be Roger Shy. Roger Shy wrote a book on regionalisms, and that's why he knew this. It's Akron, Ohio. Nobody uses that phrase except for the people from Akron, Ohio. Now, do you think the person who wrote this note was trying to disguise who he was? Yes, but does he really consciously think about the fact that nobody else uses the phrase devil strip? No, he probably thought everybody calls it a devil strip. That's what language use is like. We assume that language use is universal, right? So in this case, Roger was able to look at this note and say <laughs> very quickly, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, steal any thunder here, but do you have somebody on your suspect list who's very educated who comes from Akron, Ohio? And they were able to be like, what are you, Sherlock Holmes now? Like, what is it? Yeah, we do. <laughs> and in this case, uh, they were able to solve it quite quickly. They did have a suspect who matched that profile. And, and in fact, this story, I believe, has a happy ending that that person was uh, prosecuted in the ransom, uh, the kidnapping was uh, solved happily. We don't always get to know what the happy outcomes are the cases. It's so hard to disguise the way you use language that even when you're trying, it doesn't work well. 
So this is no disrespect to Dr. McLeod, who is doing great research with this. Um, she's working with cops who are trying to pretend to be children who are targets of pedophilia scams online. Okay, so she, when she has victim, you see victim there. That's her target sample. She wants everybody to learn how to talk like a 14-year-old girl online. So this is written, really, chatting. In the middle, you see what the cops do before training. And then on the right, you see what they do after training. And they're nowhere close to matching the profile of a 14-year-old girl, are they? And Nikki's like, you know, if they would just let go of their preconceptions of what a 14-year-old girl actually does do, they could do this better. And I look at this and I say, it's actually really hard to give up your language preconceptions in any case. You know, that's why forensic linguistics works. Um, because you don't consciously think of whether you're using yeah or yes. But the girl does use yes, whether or not you think any other 14-year-old girl ever uses yes. And if you don't use yes, it's because you don't think yes, you think yeah. So it's extremely difficult to mask. Just a couple of other cases you can look up. Rob Leonard has a whole TV episode of Forensic Files, which I know you guys are all watching at home, right? That stuff's addictive. If you want to see one of his cases where he identified a murder suspect, I, sus I think a murderer, uh, with the case of negative contractions. So in this case, the murderer, uh, the person who wrote the letters, always used positive contractions, I'm coming, but never used a negative contraction. That cannot be done. That's extremely idiosyncratic. And I point this case out because in this case, it, it took months to notice that. Okay, we're not all Roger Shy. It's not always a devil strip case. It can take a long time to really figure out what it is that you're looking at. But this one's totally on YouTube. I'm not sure if it's there legally or not, but go look at it before they take it down if you want to watch this episode of Forensic Files. It's fun. Jim Fitzgerald, of course, did this work for a long time at the FBI. He's retired now working on the Unabomber case. And Tammy Gales, whose work really inspired mine, is another professor, faculty member at Hofstra, um, who did work on the FBI's threat database. And she introduces an element of corpus analysis, which is once you have a whole bunch of these, can you look at them? What are actually the features of threat letters that were actually acted upon versus features of threat letters that were not acted upon? Tim Grant in the UK has a great paper that you can find somewhere if you want to look called Text Forensics that really just worked with SMS messages. You think, oh, that's too short, that's too small a data set. But if you have a, a, a closed group of suspects and you're trying to analyze who wrote these text messages, one of the suspects or the murder victim, you can actually do that analysis as well. And I just threw up here because I'm proud. Um, in my internship with Rob Leonard, we actually improved instructions for juries who are considering awarding the death penalty so that you don't automatically assume that the death penalty is the outcome in every case which is important. One thing that forensic linguistics is not, it is not deception detection. I'm not gonna get into any arm wrestling matches with older forensic linguists who are more um, professional than I am. There are people who will tell you that they can detect deception. I find that research uncompelling. Uh, I am not convinced. Um, and so, because that's one of the questions people always ask me is can you tell if someone's lying? I'm gonna tell you right now that I would say I cannot. And I don't think uh, that that's a reliable I don't think people should steer you down that road. And it's not a unique fingerprint. Um, in fact, there's at least one person who's sitting on death row right now because of a letter that he wrote, he wrote, um, shared language, it was language that was quite different from that of the judge and the jury, but not at all different from other people in his social group. So, you know, to say that you can identify someone completely uniquely by their language, I think is extremely problematic. Don't do that. So can we identify features of social engineering phone interactions such that we could teach people to recognize when they're being hacked? That's my practical question. And I, like I said, I rent, used to run call centers, so we do a certain number of password resets for people every day, and I'd like to make sure that we're actually doing it for the people who are supposed to have that account, and not other people. I'm focusing just on the discourse analysis piece. Not because I couldn't look at the other levels, I thought I would actually get something phonological. Um, if my buddies from social engineer are here, uh, I don't think they're coming today, but you know, I started with them thinking, what about phonological evidence? It's like, nope, what I saw was on the discourse level. It's not automated. I do want to strengthen the human link if it's at all possible. And I would like to identify the crime, if it's possible. 
So my data set is a very preliminary qualitative research study using IRS phone calls that are available on YouTube. You too can go and find phone calls that people have recorded and put up on YouTube. Not ideal data because the person knows they're being scammed, otherwise they wouldn't record it and put it on YouTube. But better data than I could get in other situations and that's what I'm working with here. The IRS phone scam calls are a sincere problem, right? So more than 890,000 phone calls uh, reported to uh, the tax ins or Treasury Inspector General within about 15 months and millions of dollars paid out on these scams. Americans are also uncertain about tax penalties, which is part of what makes the IRS phone scam so successful. And most of us, well, I won't say most of us, there is a certain number of Americans who do underreport on their income taxes. That's a known fact. So there are a lot of people who do underreport, and we're not quite sure what the penalty for that is, so that makes us nervous. Fraud in general is also underreported and underprosecuted. So I want to give a shout out here to Sarah Correa at Swansea University in the UK, who is doing very important research and pointed out that only 6% of the fraud that is reported there in Wales is ever referred to police for prosecution or follow up. Now, the problem with that is also that people tend to be repeat targets of fraud. Um, so there is a challenge here. So this is my qualitative study and I'm looking again for non-standard discourse features. I'm sorry, pass the bread, not what we expect, right? This is my favorite one. I do have four features to show you. I'm going to squish two together. Two we're going to use for a test. This is my favorite. Polar tag questions. What is a polar tag question? A polar tag question is when you end your conversational turn with a question that is a yes no question. However, when that happens, nobody ever says no. If I say, I'm going to ask you a question, okay? <laughs> there's always, see at Black Hat, there's going to be some, someone who's bloody minded enough to say no. Uh, it's actually very difficult to say no to a polar tag question. I encourage you to try it. Not with the TSA, um, which is the other place where I started. So once you start noticing polar tag questions, you're going to start hearing them everywhere. And the place that I've noticed they occur a lot is at the TSA, because I always get the pat down. And they're always like, OK, hold your arms out like this, OK? I'm going to run my hands down the outside, OK? I'm going to put my, you can put your arms down, OK? No is not an option, right? So you can sit there and be bloody minded and be like, I would say no. You cannot say no. If you say no, they take you off somewhere. Uh, the other place you'll notice this a lot is if you have children. I want you to turn off the TV, all right? And then I want you to go upstairs, okay? And I want you to clean your room. And then it's time to put your pajamas on and then brush your teeth, all right? And you don't want to know. No is not an option in that situation, right? So polar tag questions, there's actually been decades of research on this. Oh, I'm going to go past this and then come back to it. Polar tag questions prefer a response, they prefer a positive response, and they prefer a response that accepts the situation, accepts the proposition. If you say go upstairs and put your pajamas on, the subtext is it's bedtime, and if they don't accept that premise, now you have a fight, right? But you expect them to accept that premise. Here's what I saw in the data. I know this is a little bit small text, but this is the scammer on the right, the target's on the left, the scammer says, all right, ma'am, you would be getting this tax pay order there, okay? She says, okay. And then he says, okay, ma'am, but first we have to go to that store before going to that store, ma'am, because the store people, they won't be, they don't, they only accept the cash, so you have to go to your bank first, need to withdraw the money, then you have to go to the store to purchase this tax pay vouchers, all right? He's always ending on a polar tag question. Seven to 33 occurrences of polar tag questions in just the phone calls that I looked at. Again, could happen anywhere, but it's non-standard. So let's take a look at another feature. Topic control and question deferral. Now I'm squishing them together here for the sake of time. They're not the same. And in, this, and in other scams I'm starting to look at now, they don't behave the same. Um, and this is just a joke. Can I just, nope. Uh, that's a joke because in fact, the topic has been controlled and there has been a question deferral, but it's with an interruption. It doesn't have to be an interruption. Now this is totally an eye chart and I apologize, they instructed me not to use any font less than 20 point and I'm just like, I gotta get all this on this chart, I apologize. But this is 15 occurrences of questions from the target to the scammer and the scammer 
constantly deflects to the future or refuses to answer or interrupts or does something else to defer the question. Now this is a form of topic control, but it's more noticeable that it's question deferral. Because if I asked you a question, not that guy because he's not participating, but you know, if I ask you a question, normally you answer the question. It's actually kind of hard to not answer a question. This scammer is very purposefully not answering the question. So it's always, you know, who do I send this to? We'll talk about that later. What's your address? We'll talk about that later. What do I do afterwards? We'll talk about that later. And the joke I like to make about this is if this was a first date, you wouldn't have a second date. This is creepy, right? Where are we going to go out and get some dessert? Well, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> you know, don't, if, that, if that's not obvious to you, pro tip, don't go out on a second date, all right? That's not cool. This is creepy behavior, not standard and creepy. Now, the last one I'm just going to mention for fun because you're all intellectually curious and you came and saw my talk at Black Hat and I appreciate that. We could, we could chat more about whether this is actually useful for anything other than getting into fights with your significant other, which I don't recommend. But there is such a thing as violation of narrative structure, especially in witness statements and stuff like that. People have been doing research on narrative structure since the 60s. William LeBeau was really the first person. And a narrative has a structure. Even if you are just going to the store to turn in a shirt, you know, I'd like to return this shirt. That's an abstract. Um, you put it on the counter. That's the orientation. Um, I forgot the receipt. I don't know if I even have it anymore. That's the complicating action. I can't keep track of anything because you want to say mea culpa, right? Like you want the nice person to help you, but you're not, like you know you're the bad guy. Um, there's an evaluation. There's always a result. I'm hoping you can help me with this. And then the coda is I'm only at the store once a, once a year, right? You know, this is why I can never go back again. Can't We can never go back to that bar again. The coda forestalls further questions. There are structures. The structure for these phone calls is not correct. You owe the IRS. There's nothing you can do about it. Police are coming to arrest you. And what? That's not a story. That's a setup for an emergency. So again, the scammers are trying to pull you into a current emergency. And I have to say, I don't have any great data. If you guys have great data, please call me about like wiretap fraud and some of these other things. Uh, creating an, a current emergency is part of the goal of the scammers. Uh, this is that current emergency. It's not a story. It's a malformed story. So. I'm throwing it out there because I think it's going to be more broadly applicable in other situations. It's probably the toughest thing to recognize at that moment, though. So don't feel like, oh, I have to notice when there's a violation of narrative structure. Like, I'm going to hand out charts of the steps of the story. No, let's not go there. That's not going to work. Uh, because I do understand the pitfalls of human training and education. Uh, but I want to throw out there that, because it's part of a pattern I'm going to talk about very briefly at the end. So let's take the two useful ones, polar tag questions and question deferral. Can you strengthen your organization, especially your whatever call centers or wherever you feel like you have a point of vulnerability in a phone interaction, by educating them about these linguistic peculiarities? Now again, I'm very aware of the shortcomings of training and of education in general, um, but I would like it to fail closed and I would also like it to, I would like to strengthen that part of the organization maybe without recording every phone call, maybe not. Maybe we can't, but let's try. I think you can. So you can use the polar tag questions as a detection. Humans are your sensor in this case. I'm sorry you can't program them, but you can try. Notice polar tag questions. I would bet that now leaving this conversation, many of you are going to go home and you're going to be like, hey, polar tag questions. You're going to see it at the TSA. Get the pat down. It's very educational. Uh, and you're going to start listening for them. At the moment that you notice a lot of polar tag questions, then you could step back a second. Now, when to step back is the hardest thing in hardening human contact. Right? Because just telling people to constantly be vigilant doesn't work. We had a talk here just yesterday about spam uh, phishing emails, and the, question, the point made that you know, putting people in deception mode and asking them to behave like James Bond all the time is very difficult. I would say it's also impossible. Right? You can't constantly be suspicious of every single person you talk to all the time. It doesn't work. And people who work at helplines want to help. That's why they're in that job. Right? They're there to help you. 
So what can we do to not just say be suspicious? When I, I gave this talk at uh, brief, a brief, briefer version, not the whole talk, uh, at a cybersecurity group and one fellow who did cybersecurity training was like, you know, I remember the day that the IT people came in and said, be more careful with opening your email. And he's like, what does that mean? Do I need a hat? Do I need gloves? Like, what is that? Should I get a muff? I don't know what that means. You have to tell people what to look for. Asking for heightened awareness is not sufficient. I am convinced of that one. So pay attention to polar tag questions. That's a decent sensor ask, and you can do that. And then once you are in a situation where you are hearing a lot of polar tag questions, use the question deferral as a test. Ask the person a question. Do they answer? Okay, so I previewed this with my, uh, my brilliant uh, help desk manager, previously mine, uh, at uh, my student help desk, who really is brilliant, Dan Ramirez. And I said, you know, what about this? And he said, you know, I feel like I hear polar tag questions a lot, and I'm trying to think of where it is, and I think it's from people who, for whom English is not a native language. If you work on a university campus like mine, you probably have a lot of people now coming for whom English is not a native language. And I thought about it, and I realized he's true. He's right. I'm a bad speaker of many uh, languages that are not English. And I, you know, I end probably, you know, in Barcelona, I probably end every sentence with an OK. And the reason is because I want to know if I've been understood or heard. So I'm going to remind you of what I said at the top of the talk. There's native speakers. I was born speaking this language. I've been speaking it in my life. There's fluent speakers perfectly comfortable holding a conversation, even though they might occasionally drop an article or you know, that maybe their accent has some, some details. And then there's language learners. Language learners are usually identifiable in that they're not going to be able to hold a conversation. OK, for me in Spain, emparedado con pollo is like a big speech, right? And it's also a wrong speech, because I don't eat bread, right? So, so I'm not going to have a sandwich. Uh, but that's like my big speech in Spanish, because I'm a terrible Spanish speaker. Uh, if you have a person that's interacting with you who's not, who's really a language learner of English, and they're ending every conversational turn with a polar tag question, there's a reason for that. But again, ask a question. If they heard you, understood the question, and are able to answer it, that's a sufficient test that they're not trying to push you, they're not trying to herd you, they're not trying to coerce you, right? And of course, all of our help desk managers do this by default. We do it all day, right? When someone calls and they, they're just like, I need you to do this. You know, please reset my password. And you're constantly saying, how did you lose your reset address? You know, did you try it online? Blah, 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 blah. And they have to answer. Otherwise, eventually, we're like, you know, maybe not. I think that there's some, so let's just chat about the extensibility of this for a second. This is a preliminary and qualitative study. That means I have a very small data set and I am looking for features that I would then do a quantitative analysis on. If you have a larger data set that you want a quantitative analysis of, please see me because I would love to do it. Does that mean that it's not valuable? No, I think it is. And if you take a step back from all of the stuff that I've shared with you today, and it took me months to do this, but you're going to realize that what I'm describing here is coercive language coercive conversation, conversation. Not all phone scams are coercive. So there's the great DEF CON recording that we've all heard of the woman who gets uh, phone account privileges within about three minutes using a recording of a crying baby. She's gonna win. She's not bullying anybody, okay? There's nothing coercive about her interaction. However, a lot of phone scams are coercive. Okay, not just the IRS phone scams, there are other phone scams that are coercive, including just the brief recordings that I've been able to hear of the wire transfer fraud cases that are out there. There's a lot of bullying that goes on in there, a lot of do this or you're fired, and I think if you were paying attention to the polar tag questions and the question deferral there, you would see, I'm, as a, if I'm the target, I'm not allowed to contribute anything, do anything other than comply. Notice that when it occurs. And I would also just mention about that, that means that if your organization is the type of organization where coercive phone interactions are normal, you will lose. If it is normal for people to call each other up over the phone and bully them, you have a problem, okay? I know at least one CISO who ha heard a recording of someone, not him, 
calling one of his call centers and saying, this is person's name, this is what I need to do for me. No conversation, just that was the beginning of the phone call. That's coercive. So you can at least try and strengthen your organizations against those kinds of attacks. And again, if you got data, call me, call me if you have data. Data is the toughest thing to get a hold of. If you're interested in forensic linguistics in general, you can always contact the Institute for Forensic Linguistics Threat Assessment and Strategic Analysis at Hofstra University. Just trips off the tongue, right? Rob Leonard and Tammy Gales, uh, fantastic uh, academic researchers and practitioners in this area. And of course, if you want to talk more about forensic linguistics, you are welcome to call me. I can say with some assurance uh, that I am the only forensic linguist that I'm aware of who is doing cybercrime research. Uh, there are some great people in the UK, and I mentioned some of them, and uh, there's a great faculty at Hofstra. There are some great faculty doing uh, forensic linguistics research at Georgetown University, uh, and none of them really thought about or did anything with cybercrime until I showed up because they hadn't really thought about it, but nobody really thought about the fact that in every element of cybercrime or cyber hacking, there's always a language element. There's always some sort of human interaction element. So I am the person who's doing that, and I would be happy to hear from you if you were interested in talking more about that, and I'll leave this slide up here. And I'm thrilled that I actually met my time goal with 12 seconds to go, and that's to leave time for you to ask questions. Not that guy, because he's non-compliant. Uh, but if any of the rest of you guys want to ask questions, no, you can ask questions. Um, give me a holler. We have some mics that I see around the, the t there's a mic there, 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 or if you just stand up and yell, I'll repeat your question. Uh, uh, so please, questions, anybody. I'll shut up for hi. a second. Oh. Yeah. Where are you? Yeah. So oh. it, it, I would imagine that politicians are very good at answering exactly these type of, or evading exactly these type of questions. Can we learn anything about that from them, about how to deal with scammers? <laughs> there's, a, there's a 1980s book on deception that is not compelling to me just because it assumes that everything politicians say is a lie. Uh, that is not compelling research. Um, not answering questions, though, I mean, that is what politicians do, right? They exactly. make their stump speech instead of answering the question, absolutely. You should ask them a question and see if they answer. We saw that last week, right, with Mike Pence and the, <laughs> the gold star mother who asked him a question at a town hall meeting, which I think he would rather not have had. Other questions? Yep. So uh, I, I believe it was a month ago or so, I heard about some, uh, a news story about someone calling Burger Kings, I think, to uh, convince the managers that they needed to smash out all the windows. Did you hear about that one? They called Burger King to... They convinced the management and the employees that they had to smash out all of the windows because there was a gas leak. And right. so there were multiple uh, stores that they were getting the windows smashed out of. So someone called Burger King to convince them to smash out their own windows. That really takes Bart Simpson to a whole new level, right? I mean, prank phone calls are not new, and getting people to do things over the phone is not new. Uh, I'm sure that we could identify forensic linguistic features of those calls if we had all that data analyzed as well. Uh, but I would bet that if we listened to them, there would be some coercive features in there, right? Maybe polar tag questions. Any other? Yeah. yeah I, I have a question. Yeah. Thank you for the impressive talk. And I think the, this question is related with what you've shortly mentioned in the end of talk. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm from South Korea, and many phones scamming in Korea are based, based on the overseas. So in this case... Uh, many phone scams are based on... Overseas. Overseas, like, yeah. yeah. So in this case, I think adversary speaks Korean as a foreign language. So is this also... Your approach is also applica applicable for the people with speaking the foreign languages? Yes. So the question was, is this approach applicable for people speaking foreign languages and talking about, you know, the, the, the scam phone calls coming from overseas? You know, in all the calls that I found that I was able to look at, the caller, the scammer, was always someone for whom English was not a native language and probably just based on the phonological aspect, somebody who's, uh, you know, maybe uh, Indian or Pakistani speaking Hindu maybe as a, as a first language. Uh, I thought that would be a feature in the phone calls that the customers would react to. They never reacted. You know, so the benefit of America is that we're a very multicultural society. We expect a lot of different type of language users to use a lot of different types of languages here, and it, they never batted an eye when they're like, oh, I got a phone call from the IRS from someone with an Indian accent. That's partly why I'm looking for features of language that aren't just, oh, someone who's not a native speaker called me. 
Because if that was enough to trigger people's suspicions, then millions of dollars wouldn't have been paid out already in this scam, right? People are vulnerable despite the fact that the person who's calling them, and some of the scam, uh, the targets will ask, you know, what office are you in? Where is your office located? You know, are you in Washington, D.C.? The scammers have those answers. Um, and of course, they're using a phone number that, you know, in some cases does or does not have the correct area code for Washington, D.C., but then they're like, oh, our offices aren't in Washington, D.C., we're in Atlanta or something like that. Uh, I would like, yes, I am trying to identify things that don't just depend on these people are all fluent speakers, these people are all native speakers, or these people happen to be language learners, or whatever that is. It's the interaction that is in included. Identifying the interaction is crucial in identifying the crime, I think. Yeah. Good. These are fun questions. See, this is what I didn't want from you. That's good. Nope, nobody's left to laugh. All the laughers left. My jokes are done now. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, you spoke a little bit about the perspective coming from the call center. I'm a customer service yeah. uh, person. So I'm curious if you have a little bit more about what you can do for your company's customer support people to aid in, I'm not quite sure what, like, but that's really what I want to know about. Like, what could, what could be done to help limit the risk that a um, user might feel like this is your company, or I, I'm not even sure what. Talk yeah. more. No, that's exactly it. That's exactly right. So that's where I started was we do a certain number of password resets for people over the phone at a university um, because most of our customers are 18 to 22 and they, a lot of them just can't do it on their own for whatever reason. We better be doing the right ones. I better not be giving people's credentials right that they, sh that they shouldn't have. And that's where I started. And that's where my tips are Train your staff about polar tag questions. Let them use question deferral as a test. Does this person answer questions? But also, as a manager, I would say, you need to just say zero tolerance policy on coercive language. That really is the bottom line. Because if, and I, I'm saying this as somebody who does run call centers and we get these phone calls, and from faculty included, we had this conversation earlier about, oh, faculty are so much fun, they're so cooperative and collaborative, and none of them have a God complex. Uh, it, it, it's for you, yeah. Uh, you can't have coercive language. If you're going to buckle under to that, you're going to lose. So that's my zero tolerance policy, and that is tough to execute in real life, but that's my recommendation. We could talk more about you know, how to do that, but that's really my, my tip. Good. Any other questions? Look, it's like blinding up here. Nobody's at the mics. Nobody else? Fanta oh, yeah, so one more. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, one more. Uh, you mentioned IRS scam and uh, it's coercive and there's always a sense of emergency, but for other kinds of, uh, kinds of scammers, um, which are like polite and, you know, uh, is it possible to extract such features for those scammers? And if yes, you know, what kind of features we can ex ex uh, extract for those? Yes, scammers? great question. Thank you for that. Eight bars and I'm off. That's a great place to conclude because the question is, can I extract language features of calls that are different, not coercive, not creating an emergency? That's actually something I'm looking at right now. Um, we're just starting to look with uh, one of my colleagues who's in the room. Uh, Microsoft scams, the Microsoft scammers where they call you and say, you know, there's a problem with your Windows machine. Interesting tip, those, those calls are not coercive. They're not mean, they're not rude. So we're just starting to look at, can we identify other features that we could try and educate people about? Um, just at the first look, it's interesting to me because it's not like the IRS phone scams. That's why I'm trying to say some calls are, right? I think some calls are coercive, some calls are not going to be, and that'll be my next research. Maybe, you know, stay tuned, maybe come back to Black Hat in a future time if they'll have me and, and talk about what else we find out next. So that's a great place to end. Thank you guys all for coming to my talk. This is so much fun. I appreciate it. And if you want to chat more, I'm going to be outside, just outside the door. Thank you.